accurate to say I've murdered more people on film than any actor in history. sure why I enjoy horror so much but I really do and I always have people like to be scared when it's in the safety of their own home or a theater they don't really have to take it with them but sometimes I think the most effective horror movies are ones that you do in fact take out of the theater in your mind and it stays with you we don't address death uh, and I remember thinking I was going to live forever when I was young, too. I didn't think, I can't believe I lived through some of the adventures I had. And the horror movie makes us confront death. It's one of the few places we do. You certainly don't do it, you know, in uh, America's Got Talent or Dancing with the Stars or the Kardashians. But you do deal with death in a horror movie. And if you go to a horror movie, if you sit in the dark with other people, there's a collective catharsis that's in the air and the energy in the air. It's a really great experience. Kind of like riding a roller coaster, you know? You know the big hill is coming and you know you're gonna be rushing down it, but you still do it. It's this great thing that can happen uh, and you share it. And you share that moment of really confronting your own mortality. And I think that's really the key uh, and really why the horror movie will always be with us is it's, it's the place to do that a little bit. I think a lot of get labeled horror icons because they happen to play a role in a film that ended up gaining a lot of notoriety or becoming a franchise or whatever it may be. Well, Kane actually legitimately loves this stuff. And I think the fact that, look, he played Jason, and Jason is a huge character, but he really held the torch for, Chase, for Jason for a long time. You know, he was doing the conventions. The other guys weren't, not at that time. It's kind of ironic that because you meet a lot of these people who play heroes and people who play bad guys. Most of the people that I've met who play heroes are assholes, and most of the people who play really bad people are nice guys. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. What I admire about what Kane has done is Kane has transcended the role. He is Kane, like he has made a brand name for himself. Kane Hodder, plus it's just a cool kick-ass name. You know, Kane being the Hawaiian word for man, I think it's kind of cool considering I grew up in the South Pacific. I have, my first name is really Hawaiian because a lot of people think it's not my real name. It's a stage name or something, but it really is my real name. The island of Kwajalein in the Pacific where an anti-ballistic missile system is being perfected. This artist's conception shows a typical operating missile site whose job will be to guard against any possible nuclear attack from communist China. I met Kane in 1971. Uh, we both lived on an island called Kwajalein. Both of our parents were assigned there. It's a military base and they had other companies out there for support. It was just an amazing place to live. Kind of a, an oasis in the, in the real world, really. I played all kinds of sports. The tough thing with playing high school sports is that we had to play in men's leagues in every sport. You know, and when you're 16, playing varsity basketball against a men's team, that's not easy. Every once in a while, certain sports like basketball, we would go to Hawaii for a trip and play a couple of high schools, which was incredible for us because we had never competed against another high school team. So we made a road trip to Hawaii. There was only 12 of us that went. It was a fun trip because it was just fun playing other high school students, for one thing, because we did much better and then we had a lot of free time and 
on one of the days, a bunch of us went to a hotel and uh, we wanted to see what the view looked like from high up in the hotel. And there was, on each floor outside the stairwell, there was a balcony you could just walk out to if you didn't have to have a room to get on that balcony. So we went up to the 35th floor of the hotel and we're looking around and I thought, hey, another golden opportunity to entertain my friends. I thought, how fun would it be for me on that 35th floor balcony to climb on the outside of the railing? So I'm holding on to the railing like this with my feet on the deck, but that's the balcony. I'm out here over just air. My friends started freaking out and that entertained me greatly. So while I'm holding on like this, I thought even more scary would be to talk to them and go, what, yeah, what's the matter? <clears throat> and then grab on before I fell. Now, 350 feet down, sometimes I'm even amazed that I did this because it's not very bright. But I saw their reaction to that and I did it one more time. Guys, I'm fine. And then grab on before I fell. They took off. They went back into the hotel, went back down. They were freaking out up the night time. And that is entertaining for me. There were several incidents like that on, uh, on Kwajalein, so he, he was a troublemaker. To make people have that kind of reaction because I'm doing something that I thought was easy because I've never really had a fear of heights at all. I just found it so much fun to do that with those guys. I didn't know about Kane's bullying before the book, and even after we talked about it, it took a long time for him to open up and really discuss the bullying and how much it affected him. During the elementary school years, when, when I was 10 and 11, I was kind of a, a meek, quiet kid and I got uh, started getting picked on a lot, and it became very severe. You know, there was a, a story that uh, happened when my buddy and I went to the community pool uh, during the summer to go swimming, and it was over at the park. We went over there and swam all day, and then we were getting ready to leave, and we saw three kids staring at us that we didn't know. They weren't from our school, and uh, for some reason, they came over and beat the hell out of us. I unfortunately got the worst end of it. There was three of them, and they were much older than us, and just uh, beat me so badly that the next day, my face was so swollen that it was hard to recognize me. And it was so bad that he was embarrassed by it, and he should have went to the hospital but he didn't even want to show his mom, so he hid in his room and, and suffered with all the pain. I just couldn't figure out why they were doing it, because we hadn't done anything to make them mad or, you know, to do anything against them in any way. They just seemed to do it for fun. I don't know if that spawned other people to do it from my school, but then I started getting bullied all the time. In, I think it was seventh grade, uh, I was caught by a guy had, that had been harassing me and bullying me, who had thrown up in a baggie earlier in the day because he was sick and threw it on the ground. And after school, thought it would be funny if he poured it in my face while other people watched. Everybody thought that was hilarious, except me, of course. You know, that's the way it was. I mean, there was always, you know, the typical pushing around, calling names, you know, slamming head into a locker, you know, stuff like that. But it's sad to say those were the things that didn't bother me anymore. That was like minor. I didn't say anything because I was embarrassed. Too. It's hard to admit to someone that you allowed this to happen because technically you did. There's nothing you can do about it because you just don't have what it takes inside of you to stand up for yourself. So you're embarrassed by it. Very often the, the response is, well, just stand up for yourself, just hit them back. All right, 
very easy to say, but unless you've been bullied, you don't understand how impossibly difficult that can be at times. When a kid is severely bullied and ends up committing suicide as a result of that, it's my opinion that happens because, not because the kid is scared or even worried about anything further happening, it's that the kid starts thinking they're worthless because they don't do anything to stop it. And until you've been there, you don't understand how impossible that can feel. And then you start hating yourself. And then you say, you know what, fuck this. I don't, I don't need to go through this anymore. I'm worthless, I don't do anything to stop, and they end their lives. Eventually, after years, I don't know how I did this, and I just somehow snapped, and I swung, and I punched him. I couldn't even believe I did it. It didn't even seem like me doing it. It seemed like I was outside my body watching me do this. I punched him, not very effectively, and I got the shit beat out of me because of it. But I went home feeling better about myself because I tried. So I thought, hey, you know what? I lost a fight. I felt better mentally that turned me around and somehow I started to let it happen less and less. And eventually it stopped. After I graduated from Kwajalein High School, while I was going to college at UNR, Nevada, Reno, I saw a sign in my dorm looking for extras for a movie. And I thought that might be interesting to go down there and just see how movies are filmed. So I went downtown Reno and was able to work on the film. It was called California Split, uh, George Siegel and Elliot Gould. And I was just an extra in, in the crowd and I was fascinated by the process of filmmaking. I worked on it for a day and then thought that was fun and I had classes the next day so I blew off those classes and went back and worked on the movie again just because I had so much fun doing it. It was the only time in my life I've ever been an extra. Even though that was only 1974, it was the start of my interest in film by, by far. It was the, the very first thing because the following year, I went to visit my buddy, Mike, and Mike lived in Los Angeles. And uh, he said, let's go to Universal Studios and go on the tour. I loved it. I, I just loved being on the back lot. I wanted so badly to get off the tram and just wander around by myself. Then the tour was over and we went uh, to a couple of the live shows, one of which was the Wild West stunt show at Universal. And we watched the show and that was it. As soon as that show was over, I said, that's what I want to do. And I knew it from that moment. Once he gets something in his head, and sorry, Kane, but it, it just stays there. No matter what you say to him, you, you can't change his mind. Very fortunate, of course, over the years to get to where I've gotten, but I've also worked hard. It wasn't handed to me in any way. On a professional level, I love the fact that he takes these parts so seriously. And there's a lot of times, especially with producers or studio execs, where they'll say like, you know, whoever is going to be this villain, we just need a big menacing physical presence and, you know, preferably a stunt guy who can take hits and punishment. Kane really gets into it, and that's why the characters he plays are memorable. Did a movie called Prison in 1987. I was happy to be the stunt coordinator on it. It was a great movie stunt-wise, and then at the end of the shooting, John Beekler, who was doing the makeup effects, said, we have to have a guy in the full body prosthetic makeup the wrongly executed prisoner comes out of the ground strapped to an electric chair, and he has full makeup, head to toe, prosthetics, dentures, lenses, everything. 
And I said, uh, well, I've never done it. I'm happy to do it because it's not a comfortable thing. I'd actually designed it on another actor. But when I went to Wyoming, I saw that, you know, Kane, I think he had the chops for it. I put everything on. It took three and a half hours to put everything on. And then Rennie said, you know, it would be really cool since this is a, a corpse that has been buried. He said, why don't we put live night crawlers all over you? I said, how cool would it be if I had live worms in my mouth? And he's like, you would do that? I said, yeah, I, 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 I still don't think that was a big deal. He went nuts with it, really. So I put him in my mouth and did the shot. And I think that Rennie and John Beekler both were impressed at my enthusiasm for working in that kind of makeup. And John in particular liked how I moved in the makeup. The thing I noticed about Kane during prison was that he worked with the makeup. Uh, it's, it's one thing to design a cool looking creature effect. It's another thing to have it performed well. And aside from being an amazing stuntman and a really fine actor, he works with the appliances and he tries to do as much as he can with them. And that, that stuck with me. So that's 1987, the following year, John Beekler is hired to direct Friday the 13th, part seven, and immediately says, I got the guy that I want to play Jason. I wanted Kane, and I knew that he could act, and I knew that he could really work with the appliances, and I wanted to take the mask off of Jason, and I wanted people to see how pissed off he was. The thing I gave to the Friday the 13th movies was the rage of Jason. The makeup for part seven was my favorite look. Uh, very, very well done makeup. It created the illusion that when he opened his mouth, he saw in through holes. The very first shot I ever did as Jason in part seven being my first movie was the single shot where Tina has a vision and sees Michael being stabbed in the kitchen of the house. That is the very first thing I ever shot as Jason. When I put that stuff on and went to the set, it felt so natural. And people are gonna go, oh my God, he's, he's so full of shit. But really, it, it felt right for me to be wearing that stuff. But I wanted to do whatever I could for to make the movie look good. To this day, it's still my favorite look of Jason, of all of them, really, certainly of the ones I did. There had been six films before I ever came into the picture. So the Friday the 13th name, the Jason name, were known worldwide. For me to be able to step into that role, how do you not consider that a huge honor? And you better do it justice. You're given an opportunity of a lifetime, so you need to do whatever you can to add to that. He brings this sort of special uh, focus, I think, to Jason. When I first put the makeup on and looked in the mirror, I thought, when Jason is staring at someone and not moving, he looks like a mannequin. So I said, what can I do to still do that same stare, but add life to the character. I don't think people understand how hard that is to, to make anything. A lot of it's just the movement, a little movement, you know, a lot of it's in the eyes. He gets in front of that mirror, and he looks at the makeup, and he figures out what he can do with it. He, he pushes the limits, he, and he talks to the makeup artist, can I do this, will it hurt the makeup? I mean, he, he's very specific. I came up with the, the breathing thing, so instead of this, you see this. And to me, that made it look like the character was about to spring any moment. Even though he's motionless staring at you, the heaving chest looks scary as hell, and people have said that's like my one of my signature things that I do, but I just thought it worked. Kane owns that. And, and I think that it's, um, it's very special. I think that most fans immediately can tell if it's some other person wearing the mask. And it's, uh, 
why it's important for true fans, I think, that, uh, that they really respond to what, the way Kane did it. I remember the first time I seen him and he was just breathing and taking an air and you just, I was like, oh my God, oh my God, I'm not gonna sleep tonight, motherfucker. And Jason's just a predator, you know, that's it. It's like an automatic need, you know, just pure nihilistic, must destroy, you know. And there's something about the way Kane plays that focus that's really fun. I have never in my life broken a bone which I'm proud of because I always think it's funny that stunt people brag about how many bones they've broken. Isn't the whole point to do a stunt successfully? Because anybody can be crazy and just go do something and get hurt. But the whole point is to have a stunt career successful that you don't get hurt. So I always find it funny when guys say, oh, I broke 225 bones. You're not very good then, are you? Kane is perhaps the safest stunt coordinator that you'll ever want to work with. He is very strong, very firm, very creative on the set. He can figure out something ridiculous and over the top instantly. There was a scene written where, uh, as Jason, I chase Tina up the stairs. To, and she goes up the top of the stairs where the door, of course, is locked and there's no escape. So I come up the stairs. The way it was written in the script was, she makes the light start moving and it swings and hits me in the chest and I tumble down the stairs. I mean, Kane doesn't do things 50%. He does things 150%. You tell him to scrub a floor, he'll scrub the shit on the floor. And I said to Beekler, I said, eh, that's not too bad, but how cool would it be if that thing just swings and hits me right in the face, in the mask, and then I just fall back like a tree and I go through the stairs. He was going, he goes, wow, that, you could do that? And I said, I think so, I think it would look great. I think it's more in character of Jason tumbling down the stairs, I think kind of looks too human. Take the hit and then fall straight back onto the staircase. That's one of my favorite shots in the movie as well. It must have been difficult, but you could never tell by the way he performed. He, he never showed the, the discomfort of the difficulty it was always 100% performance. We were at the lake set, this is in Bay Manette, Alabama. To go to the, the dressing rooms, I would always walk through the woods and whenever I was in character in any of the movies, I like to leave the mask on and kind of stay in character. You know, two o'clock in the morning one night or something and uh, walking on the trail and uh, I saw someone coming to the set, someone who I didn't recognize. And I thought, hmm, this might be fun. So I stopped on the trail, still had the mask on, everything. And I s stared at him and he uttered the most ridiculous question I think I've ever heard. He looked at me in all that makeup and said, uh, excuse me, are you with the movie? That's a dumb bastard right there. So I just stared at him and he started looking around. Yeah, you're, you're with the movie, right? And that's when I lunged at him. And uh, he took off running back to the trucks and never saw him again. But the next day, uh, just talking to Beekler before we started, he said, hey, you know that, uh, that local sheriff never showed up last night? And I said, oh, wonder what happened. So... <laughs> For a long, long time, my all-time favorite kill was a Jason kill. A sleeping bag. A sleeping bag. Sleeping bag. Sleeping bag. Sleeping bag. Sleeping bag. Sleeping bag. The sleeping bag. Sleeping bag kill in part seven. The sleeping bag is one of the most classic ones in history. You know, I killed somebody with something that's not a weapon. That's pretty amazing. And it was just such an impactful kill in the theaters. I went to the Chinese theater in Hollywood when the movie opened just anonymously and sat in the back and when that kill came up opening night and I watched the, half the audience stand up and high-fiving each other and stuff, I said, that was, that was a pretty amazing feeling. One of Kane's most legendary stunts is his burn in part seven. At the time, it was a record long fire burn. The entire thing is on screen. And I thought, let's make it a little different than what you normally see because you typically never saw 
the ignition of the stunt person on camera. It always cut from somebody making a reaction, then it cut to the person on fire already moving around. This girl has telekinetic powers, so why don't we have her make the fire blast out of the furnace and ignite Jason on camera? And Beagle was like, wow, I've never seen that really. And I said, I haven't either, so that's why I want to do it. We did the ignition of the character on fire with a propane cannon. Then I started stumbling around and doing my acting, which I always loved doing. And ultimately, by the time I went down, because I was going by the feel of it, I have been on fire so long that the fuel is almost gone. I was on fire for 44 seconds which is if you watch your watch for 44 seconds and imagine being completely engulfed in flames for that long, it's an incredibly long time. And it was set some kind of records at the time. To this day, it's probably my favorite fire stunt. And not only is it an amazing on-screen fire burn, it's a stunt done by someone who almost died from a fire burn. So it's really poetic. I mean, you have to admit that in Friday the 13th, part seven, he gave one of the most spectacular full body burns you've ever seen in your life. And this from a man who was burnt horribly. I always say that one of the best qualities to have as a stunt person is a common sense knowledge of physics, where you think of a stunt and you anticipate what's gonna happen and what could go wrong. And that's a huge attribute in the stunt business to think, well, what if this happens, then what are we gonna do? So then you prepare for that. So maybe I learned much more from my mistake, but at the time, you have to protect yourself. So until, you know, basically until the book came out, I never admitted the real story. Because he knew for the first time ever he had to face the truth. Um, he was embarrassed about it for years. He lied. He told stories to other people that it was on the set of this, on the you know the set of that. He made up different you know situations how it happened, but he, no one knew. So it was really this powerful moment with me and him when he finally decided he could tell the world and kind of open up and tell the story and not be embarrassed about it anymore. That he's matured enough to to face the facts and tell the full story. Since I had officially gotten into SAG and done a TV show, that's when I talked to this reporter and she said, let's do a story about the local kid that's making his way in the stunt business. You know, I'll give you some pictures and if you want, I'll do a fire stunt for you live. And she said, really? I said, sure, I've been doing it, no problem. And we, we went out, it was just her and I. We happened to pick a place that was where I was doing the fire stunt. It was right next to a lake, like six feet away from a lake. But because it was a lake, it was real windy. And we did the stunt, and I was on fire, and I put myself out, no problem. I knew that I wasn't going to be happy with it, because the wind was blowing so hard, it was blowing the flames down. So I didn't think it looked as dramatic. Too bad I didn't just settle with it. So the next day, they went to a different area in the desert, not near the lake, not near the water. Um, he had no safety stuff with him, it was just him, his lighter, and the biggest mistake he did was he couldn't afford rubber cement at the time. Um, even though it was a few bucks, he was broke trying to struggle in Hollywood. I said, I, I ran out of glue, can you get me some? The reporter brought some from the office saying, here you go, here's some rubber cement so you don't have to spend your own money. Having never used that brand before, Kane didn't realize how flammable it was. I got all prepped and ready and I went to light myself, which is normally, when I would do this, you'd have to touch the glue with the flame to make it ignite. He put his arm out away from himself to be safe, and when he lit the match, he ignited. Completely burst into flames everywhere. You always see stop, drop, and roll on TV commercials and stuff, and that's a nice theory, but the thing that people don't understand unless you've been on fire is that when your head is in the flames and you can hear your hair burning and you can feel your face burning and your ears burning, 
you run. It's not the right thing to do. It's a reflex. And every person that I've ever talked to that was been burned seriously in the upper body says the same thing they ran. As I'm running and burning, she doesn't realize I'm out of control and in trouble, so she keeps snapping pictures. And again, I don't blame her in the least for any of this. But she didn't realize until I started screaming, probably, that I was in trouble. Then I somehow got my wits about me and realized there was some kind of dampness on the ground. Dove into there and rolled around and finally got myself put out. And when he finally was kind of conscious enough to see the reporter, the reporter looked at him and that's when he knew how horrible it was. All my clothes that I had on were gone. My skin was falling off. I had mud all over me from the ground that was falling off with my skin. I knew I was in very, very bad shape. She said, let's go. We got in her Jeep. We said, we got to get somewhere to get some help because this is very serious. My face was burned, everything. My hair was gone. And we're driving in the Jeep out of the desert. And the first thing we see is a fire station. I think, oh, perfect. We go there, we bang on the door, we try and get, nobody answers. So we got back in the car. We went to the first house we could get to. And the photographer, sorry. The photographer knocks on the door and the lady answers. And she looks at me terrified and says, get in here. And I said, what? And she goes, get in the shower, stand in my shower, I'll call the ambulance and they'll come and get you. So I do that. As I walk through the house, <sighs> sorry. <sighs> As I walk through the house, there's a little girl. sitting on the floor playing, and she was terrified. And I don't blame her. I mean, the way I looked, she was scared to death. I kept looking out of the shower, looking at my eyes, thinking, why does this not hurt yet? And I was just astounded that I knew I was severely injured and there was no pain. But I kept waiting for something to start hurting. And the ambulance finally came. I walked back out. The girl wasn't there anymore, thank God, because I felt horrible. I felt worse for her than I did for myself. I was three years old or something, just scared to death. And uh, got in the ambulance and sat up the whole time in the ambulance all the way there. As it turns out, when you burn that badly, you burn the nerves completely off and there's no pain for a while. The next day, it was incredible and didn't stop. That basically started uh, the next six months of horrific torture. Can we cut for a second? Once the pain started after the initial shock wore off, uh, it was so much more than I ever anticipated. So much worse than you can even imagine. The worst part of this was he had no painkillers in him. Um, he didn't know it at the time, but his father pulled aside the doctor and asked him not to give him any painkillers. And the doctor went along with that. I'm not sure why he didn't just say no. He needs pain medication to get through this. So I had less medication than I should have had. And the reason for that was his father was in the war 
And he saw his fellow um, soldiers who came back with injuries who got addicted to painkillers, and he was scared of that was going to happen to Kane. And I know my dad was just trying to look out for my best interest. He didn't want me to become addicted to stuff, but that's something you have to worry about later. You have to get rid of the pain so you can heal. But the pain itself was so unbelievably tremendous. I got to the hospital and I didn't know anything about what is the proper way to take care of burns. And neither did my parents, so whatever the hospital did for me, we thought was good. I, I, I don't know how else to say it, they weren't equipped at all to take care of my injury, but they thought they were. My parents came in when they could, and my dad walked in and left immediately. They could just see me from here up, and my face would burn, but not as badly as the rest of my body, so I didn't look that terrible. I didn't know till later, when he walked in, the smell that was in my room because of me being burned, I guess brought back terrible memories of him during the war. He had to run out and he had to go to the bathroom and throw up. And then I remember my mom lifting up the, the sheet and looking at this arm and just started crying because it looked so terrible. It was very, very hard for my parents to see their son in that situation. Because I was burned all in the upper body, I couldn't use my hands at all. So I couldn't go to the bathroom by myself. I couldn't even change the channel of the TV myself. It was a, a terrible way to have to live. And especially since I was 22, when someone else has to help you take a piss or wipe your ass, it sounds funny, but it's very humbling. Then they would take me to what's called the Hubbard tank, and they have to get rid of the dead tissue. Even when you're healing, dead tissue accumulates and has to be removed so the fresh tissue can heal. So they would put him down in the basement because he would scream so loud they had to kind of hide him from all the other patients. They would soak him in a bathtub, and then the doctor would take the backside of a scalpel and scrape all of the burned area to get the material off that needed to be debrided. And this is, again, when I couldn't even stand the vibration from somebody kicking my bed, now you're gonna scrape it? I, 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 there is no way I can ever express the amount of pain there was. They did a skin graft surgery and they splinted my arms straight out like this from my body. I couldn't move. That's because they wanted the skin to take. And when you do skin grafts, you need to be motionless. So the, your, it has to be your own skin and it can adhere and start growing to your body. It's taken from a healthy area, my legs, put on the burned area and hopefully grows into it and helps cover up the burn. As I'm barely conscious coming out of the uh, OR, going back to my room, they realize I can't get in my fucking room because my arms are like this. I'm too wide to go through the doorway to my room. So now I have to, after, just after waking up from major surgery, have to stand up like this, walk into my room, wait for them to bring the bed in and then get back in my bed, which I thought was the most asinine thing you could ever do. Not look ahead to that. You couldn't see that coming. So that was just, one of the first days and that was an indicator of what to, what was to come. I was in that hospital four months, consistently getting worse every day, trying skin grafts that didn't work. One of the most important things with a burn injury is to keep a sterile environment around the patient. And when I'm in a room with another person who has some other kind of problem, that's not sterile. And that's what happened in that hospital and everyone had to scrub down and come in, except for the doctor, the doctor who would come through and not wash his hands, be wearing his tennis shoes, and just walk over and check Kane. I was amazed that he thought everybody else should do it, but he was above it. He shouldn't have been taking care of me at all. Unfortunately, at that hospital, they did very little correctly for me. There were such 
a long list of terrible things that happened as a result of being in that hospital that never should have happened. My veins started collapsing. Now I have to submit to a needle in the vein in my groin to put pins through my elbows. You can still see the scar so that they would hold my arms up like this. When they took the pins out, I couldn't put my arms down. Not being able to sleep, and then when you finally do doze off, I would twitch. That happened every single time I would doze off, and I lost my voice completely. Put a feeding tube through my nose into my stomach. I had a catheter for a while. Gained and lost 50 pounds in five days. Seven skin graft surgeries. They kept doing the procedures, and it wouldn't work and I didn't have any health insurance. If I read it in a book, I would read it and say, ah, this can't be true, he's exaggerating. To make it sound more horrific than it was, that can't all be true, and unfortunately it was. And it's a, it's a horrifying story, because it's bad enough you know, being burned, obviously, but all the other things that went wrong, I mean, just, it couldn't have been worse. Bottom line is, at, after four months, uh, that doctor told my parents that uh, I had a staph infection and it doesn't look like I'm gonna make it. And my parents are like, what do you mean? He's, after four months, he's gonna die from the burns? Because typically, if you die as a result of being burned, it's early. You don't get through the first week. You don't die four months later usually. So they were astounded that he was saying that. And then he said, we're going to ship him to a burn unit in San Francisco. And my dad was, wait, burn unit? What? You know, we didn't know what it was. He said, what's that? And he said, it's a place that specializes in burn care. And my dad almost killed the fucking guy by saying, why did you not send him there in the first place? I get to San Francisco to Both and Burn Center in St. Francis Hospital, and everything changed. At that time, it was the best burn center west of the Mississippi River. It, it was a real first-class burn center. We had attendings, resident doctors, and nurses that all devoted their time to treating burn patients specifically. My doctors were different. This was a unit that was self-enclosed. We have our own OR. We do all our treatments here. We have hydrotherapy. That was built in 1967. The other thing that the burn unit had to deal with was that I was in bed at the first hospital for four months, never being able to sit in any other position other than maybe recline a little bit or sit up a little bit, but I was always on my back. So consequently, I had two really bad bed sores on my back. The burn unit had to deal with all that too. They had to get rid of the bed sores. They had to get rid of the staph infection. They had to get me skin grafted and get my weight up. And they did all of that in six weeks. Whereas the first hospital took four months to get me to that horrible position. So if I had been in the burn unit from the beginning, I probably would have been in there four weeks total. What stayed the same for, from when I started 35 years ago to today is the patience that it takes um, for everybody, the caregivers, the patient, the families. Um, the body heals only at a certain rate. And the, the caring part, the support that these people need is exactly the same through the years. Uh, that hasn't changed. I started getting a more positive attitude because this place is, you know, state of the art, even back then, for burn care. And then that's when the, <laughs> the depression sets in. Because at the beginning, you're just trying to survive. Now, you know you're gonna survive. Now you deal with the fact that for the rest of your life, you're gonna have that visual reminder is the scars. The biggest misconception is that it's just about the skin. Uh, it's not just about the skin. Major burns affect every system of the body. Uh, it affects the immune system. Uh, it often affects the lungs if they're burned in an enclosed space. 
Uh, it affects the GI tract. It affects every system of the body. And also then I think a lot of people underestimate the psychosocial recovery of, of burns. friends to see me like that. It's the weirdest thing, the things your mind goes through. I'm never going to be able to take my shirt off again. People are always going to stare at me. I'm going to have scars for the rest of my life, limited mo movement, which I still have. And I get very, very depressed even when I was getting better. I was laying in my bed, depressed, because uh, there wasn't much to be happy about other than surviving. And I looked at somebody come in to visit the nursing staff. Everybody had to gown up. When you go in the unit, you have to put on everything to keep it sterile, even visitors. This guy, who I didn't recognize, um, was at the nurse's station and I'm watching him, he starts laughing and having a good old time and being happy and, you know, shaking hands with people. And I was laying in there saying, fuck you. You, you have no idea what I'm going through and you're fucking happy. I don't, I hated him. Truthfully, I became somewhat, I guess you could say suicidal because I didn't know if I wanted to live like this. So I watched this guy laughing and having a good old time and thinking, God, you are so lucky. He pulls up his sleeve of his gown in just because he was warm or something, and I'm looking at him thinking, oh, wait a minute. He's got burn scars. This guy was in this unit. He's a former patient that was in here, burned badly because I could see his arm just like mine, and he's fucking happy. And I thought, holy shit. This guy does know what I went through, and he's happy? And I thought, oh man, maybe there's, maybe there's something positive that'll come out of this. He completely turned my whole attitude around. So, if he can do it, I can do it. Everything changed after that. Everything started improving. And that's the thing with the burn injury. If you're sitting and talking to somebody, and they're telling you what to expect and you don't see burn scars on them, you're, you're in your mind just thinking, you're not even listening because you don't know. But if you're sitting there with scars, I'll listen to you all day long because you do know. We do a burn support group uh, where once a month here in the burn center where we have patients come back for years to get that support from people who have been through it like them. experience that this guy completely basically saved my life a second time without even knowing it. I never even knew his name. It seems like this was the angle. Okay. It, right here. It was bigger than this. It went out a little farther. The beds were this way. Not this way. Right. We were like this. He was here. And I guess that could have been the angle I was looking at. I think that was my room. My biggest goal was to get home for Christmas. Just to be out of the hospital and home for Christmas. My doctor's name was Angelo Capozzi. 
and he was okay with sending me home really before I should have gone home. Well, I think as, as we've become more knowledgeable about taking care of burn patients, I, I think it's one of the physician's duties, you know, to keep the patient comfortable. He allowed me to go home with the training that he gave my mother for my, still I had slight open wounds all over, but small ones, because it was in between where the skin grafts were that hadn't quite healed yet. But he knew what I had been through, decided he was okay with me going home on December 23rd. I haven't seen Dr. Capozzi in 39 years. Hey, Doc. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. It's been a long time. Yes, it has. 39 years? Yeah. This area was some of my worst. You can see it was really quite deep there. I know, but it looks great. I mean, that's the only bad part. It's tight, but if you can get along with that, I mean, that's fine. Never really got to tell you thank you because you saved my life. You, there's no, I'm not trying to be dramatic because everybody knows I don't do that. You saved my life and don't try to be fucking humble about it, please. Because you like did. Like that. <laughs> so I would like to say thank you for You're very everything welcome. you did. I really appreciate that. Because I went on to have a great life. I think it's very interesting that I never developed a fear of fire, considering it almost killed me, and I understand how terrifying it is to be on fire. You would think the last thing I'd ever want to do is be on fire again, but another friend of mine that gave me a lot of good stunt jobs named B.J. Davis was doing a movie in New Orleans called Avenging Force. And uh, I had worked a little bit with him. We had become friends and he said, why don't you be one of the stunt guys to come down for the entire shoot of the movie? And I was very happy to do that. I hadn't done much on location before. So while I was in New Orleans, BJ said, I don't know how he, knew that he could ask me this, but he had a good uh, sense of my personality, I guess. He said, uh, we gotta do two, two full burns at the same time. You wanna do one with me? At first I was like, oh shit. I didn't think anybody ever asked me that, first of all. And then I started thinking about it more. I said, you know what, he knows what I've been through and he's confident in me doing it. If he had said, I probably don't want to do this, but there's a fire stunt, you know? But he didn't do it that way. I guess, you know, he just did it the right way for me. Just offer it to me without any hesitation. If I don't want to do it, fine. Somebody else will do it. But ultimately, I did the stunt with him. BJ comes flying out of a window on fire, and I come out of a doorway on fire. It was a full burn that I did again for the first time since my accident. I loved it. I felt very comfortable. I, I see how, when you do the proper setup, how easy it is to do that stunt, really. And I came to the conclusion that I love doing fire. It's very, very surprising that a burn survivor could even go near a fire again. Doing that first fire stunt again was huge, a huge step forward in forgetting about the past. I met Kane um, when he was working on a picture with Wes Craven. Called Hills Have Eyes 2. I had doubled a character called the Reaper. 
I was a stunt double for him. I was falling through a skylight and riding a motorcycle and doing some stuff around some fire. He was a wonderful and interesting guy, and clearly he was a guy that uh, <laughs> didn't seem to be afraid of anything. And I ended up doing every one of Sean Cunningham's movies for quite a while after that one, all the house movies, everything he did, really. I did the original Friday back in 1979, 80. I was around for Friday two and Friday three, but I was anxious to move on and, and you know do some other things. And so the series proceeded for a while without me, and then we decided to do um, Friday the 13th, part nine. Fortunately, the person that was hired to direct, Adam Marcus, was a fan of mine as the character and immediately said, hey, I want him to play Jason again. So this is my third go-round as Jason. He just brought a certain kind of consistency and a, and a flavor to the character that the fans really responded to, and I, I would be mad if I were to think of uh, replacing him. The last shot of the movie, when I read the script for the first time, it said, Jason's mask is laying on the ground and Freddy's hand comes out of the ground with the glove on and the sweater and grabs the hockey mask and pulls it into the ground to set up for Freddy versus Jason. And I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll tell you one thing right now, I'm gonna be wearing that Freddy glove to do that shot. Nobody else is gonna do it because Robert England is not gonna do it. I did that shot, I was underneath the the set pulled down the mask and pulled it into the set, thinking I was setting up for Freddy versus Jason. Back in 1983, I had a meeting with Wes Craven, and he said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm developing a new character, and he's gonna have burn scars, and I'm thinking about using somebody with real burn scars. And I said, wow, that's great. And, uh, you know, what, what kind of character? Well, he's not a really nice guy. He's, you know, a pedophile. I said, you know, okay, with burn scars, and his name is Fred Krueger. Wes Craven was a friend of mine. I did a series with Wes Craven, and I know that, I, I think there was a time when he was really considering Kane to play Freddy. Obviously, we know where this is all headed. I did not play the character because he decided to go with more established actor with prosthetics instead of real burn scars. And I think Robert did an amazing job as that character. And obviously, one of my horror heroes is Robert England. How different life could have been for, for everybody had that happened, but uh, I know that Wes thought very highly of him. Well, Kane and I, we go way back. Robert and I have been friends for a long time. We do conventions together, of course. And we've sort of just hit it off because we both have to go through a lot of the same off-screen fan stuff. Let's give it up for Kate Hunter and Robert England, ladies and gentlemen. When I started in this business, never anticipated ever signing an autograph. Oh, you loved it the first time that goth girl walked up to you and went, sign me, Kane. But we have worked together also, which was a lot of fun for me. I, I had uh, done a web series with Robert called uh, Fear Clinic. Well, Fear Clinic's where Kane and I got to do most of our work together, and uh, that's really where we kind of found uh, our vibe as actors together, because we were really, you know, was, we had a lot of scenes between us. I'm taking you down before you kill any more patients. I'm not fond of this new attitude of yours. Clearly you don't understand the employee-employer relationship. Now help him! Yeah, blah, blah, blah. I know, I got the body, you got the brains. It was fun working together. It's cool to have pictures of him face to face arguing with our, without makeups on. Really, Freddy versus Jason in a different way. There was still this, this pressing, my pressing need to, to go ahead with Freddy Jason. And still, because of New Line and, and, and uh, Robert England and some other, other issues, we, uh, we couldn't do that, at least not yet. And so that's what led us to Jason X, or Jason in Space. It seemed like a really good idea. It was a really fun notion to try to figure out how we would do all of that. The, the sets were amazing, and the movie was 
pretty clever, I thought. There was a part of the film where somebody created a virtual reality to try and slow Jason down. And all of a sudden, Uber Jason was back at Camp Crystal Lake. We're in space and we're looking for all the kind of gags that we used to do and that Jason's known for. Basically, this is just for the fans, really, the fans of the previous films. I had a girl in a sleeping bag and I was slamming her against her friend that was in her sleeping bag, so killing them both with each other. We did the stunt uh, that the fans so loved. But it was my idea to do one shot to the tree just uh, as a throwback. It was just so silly. My hands down favorite Jason kill is the frozen head in Jason X, where he lifts it up and then just shatters it. They freeze the head in liquid nitrogen, they smash it. Liquid nitrogen is smashed on a table. And then smashed it, and her brain rolls out. I thought that was great. No one is expecting that, and it was just so gory and so crazy, and just the way he just does it, just tosses her aside, is like an awesome kill. <laughs> I got a call from a, an executive at New Line. She wanted to have lunch with me. She gave me a script called Freddy vs. Jason, and she said, we're finally doing this movie. And I said, that is fantastic. I'm so happy to hear that. I assumed at that time that meant I was doing the movie. You're giving me the script and saying we're finally doing this movie. Pretty, pretty sure thing in my mind. Then in the, in the weeks that followed, I started getting a weird vibe from New Line. Well, I knew Kane. I, I, I was told by the powers to be for most of that prep time, it was always gonna be Kane. Ultimately, I was told that they had hired somebody that played Jason before. Then I found out it was Kurzinger. And I was like, how, how was he have, having played the character before? And then I remembered in part eight, because they didn't want me to take a chance of getting hurt and not being able to work, I was forced to allow Ken Kurzinger to do the car hit, where the cop car hits Jason in the alley. Even though I've done that stunt many times, they thought if you get a broken leg or something, we're in trouble. It seems to me that someone, I don't think it was him, I'm almost sure it wasn't him because I've talked about it with him, but someone had represented him as having played the character also based on that shot. That was a done deal. He was already hired and I, to say the least, I was devastated. I mean, it's only a role, but it's something that I had put my heart and soul into for 15 years, four films in a row, and it seemed like, uh, you know, that none of that mattered. I never in a million years would have given them a reason to replace me by saying, hey, I want this much money, and they just say, oh, I can't afford that, let's go somewhere else then that's on me. But I would never have given them any kind of reason. I was never difficult to work with. Uh, I was never late to the set and undependable, nothing like that. So I couldn't understand why I was replaced and I don't think I'll ever know the real reason. It was a very, very low point of my career, but it was almost as low a point for me as getting burned because it just, I was never told any, any reason. It took me a long time to get over that. For almost 20 years, he was Jason and in thousands of fans, probably millions around the world, he is Jason. He always will be Jason, no matter if someone else plays him more than once or 
if you know he never plays it again, he will always be the Jason because he's the one that made him iconic, that made him more than just the guy with the mask. After the whole mess of uh, not doing the Freddy vs. Jason movie and got contacted by Adam Green about a new character that he thought could be a franchise also. Well, my first project with Kane was the original Hatchet. And I was a huge fan of all the slashers, uh, Michael Myers, Jason Voorhees, Freddy Krueger, and the, the concept of possibly having Kane Hodder be Victor Crowley was always just kind of like a pipe dream. And then John Beekler, who was doing the effects, when he first suggested, well, why don't I show the script to, to Kane? I was just like, really? Like, seriously? Because I didn't think he'd want to do it, uh, just because he's already, he's already done it. And he had been a fan of my work as Jason and wanted to talk about playing a character called Victor Crowley. With Jason, he came into that so late in the game. And as much as he's the Jason, as far as anybody who knows what they're talking about with Friday the 13th goes, uh, this was a, a great opportunity, especially because it's, it's a very different character and it's, he's not hidden behind an emotionless mask. I was somewhat excited because it was similar to Jason. It was a character in makeup that didn't speak and killed everyone he could reach. That movie was very surprising. It was very over the top. It started, it sounded, it sounded sort of like a comedy at first, and then suddenly it switches gears and it turns in the most horrendous, over the top makeup effects extravaganza you've ever heard of, and I love that. I think Adam purposely didn't reveal everything in the first movie so he could give some more information over the second one and ultimately answer everything left in the third one. That's pretty confident for a guy that was unknown at the time to assume that you're gonna get the chance to tell your whole story over the course of three films. Kane was really one of the only people who I said what the next two movies were gonna be. Because I feel like if you're gonna do a slasher series, you have to have an end game and you have to have things planned out. The idea of just making one and then all of a sudden it performed, so now you're gonna make another one, you can start to tell as a fan, like they're just kind of finding their way with this and they're just either repeating the same movie over again or they're making shit up, but I had a plan. There were a lot of similarities to Jason with uh, Victor and I did not want to do the same thing. I wanted to do more of a, of a grotesque guy and um, we did a, a, an appliance, a dental appliance and the prosthetics on, on top of him and, uh, I did it in such a way that it was, it was risky because there was so much prosthetic on his face, but I think it worked out pretty well. Kane really gets into it, and that's why the characters he plays are memorable. When you have a real actor behind these prosthetics and, and, and makeup, like, you know, I mean, it, it makes such a difference. You, you can tell when it's somebody just going through the motions and when it's a character. There are a lot of actors that could have simply thrown the makeup on and thrown the prosthetics on and just getting in front of the camera and going, ah, you know, like Godzilla in a Godzilla suit or something like that. He was, every night, in uncomfortable situations, he was off taking it very, very seriously, so that when he came out and when he did his performance, uh, it had a lot of weight behind it. It had a lot of realism. I mean, the character really seems like a creature that's in pain. And so the fact that he takes it so seriously and does not want the other actors to see him at all. So when he's in the makeup, he stays separate. Whenever I'm playing, killer like Jason or Victor or anyone really, uh, I like to mm, fuck with the actors a little bit for their performance being enhanced and also just for my own entertainment. The cast just didn't know anything about him and never got to see him or, or spend time with him. And I think that, that made a huge difference because that way what you see in the movie when the cast sees Victor Crowley, I and mean, that's their first time seeing him, and they were terrified. So what he'll do is 
as he's getting into character, you don't know where he is. He's off in the woods somewhere, and you just hear him screaming or kicking trees or and just these bursts of... Rah, rah, and, like, yeah, the cast is terrified at that point. So the cast is already convinced that he's half crazy anyway. And by doing things like that, it just brings so much more to their performance. We would do some rehearsals sometimes without him. B.J. McDonald would come out and say, uh, so Kane's gonna come out from behind a tree and when you see him, squeeze off a couple of shots and you know, say your lines and, and run off in the other direction. So uh, a lot of times, the only time I saw Kane on the set was when they would go action and Victor Crowley would come out, be in frame, scream something horrible at us and then I'd be running for my life. And what was so funny about it is when you don't do a lot of rehearsal with him, he actually comes out of the pitch black, you know, out of the woods, and he scares the crap out of you. Amanda! There's an interesting connection about having been through some violent acts in my past and being able to recreate those on film has to have helped somewhat because uh, that's what people say the most is when, uh, when they watch me kill somebody on film, it's so violent. So it's kind of like to become the ultimate badass. So I think it's, it's a pretty interesting thing that he picked up as a result of his background. You know, he, was, he got used to torment and agony and suffering, and then he just started getting paid for it. Good deal. When it comes to your death scene, it's not gonna be easy. I'm not gonna hurt you, but it's not gonna be comfortable either because I like a little bit of realism. And without fail, the actor will say, God damn, that was a little rough. Then they see it on screen and they love it. And they're happy we did it that way. You know, I've known him for 33 years now. Always wanted him to kill me. And finally, that was the thing where he sawed me in half with a chainsaw. And I told the guy that was behind me, Colton, I said, Colton, he's gonna take a chainsaw and stick it between our legs and lift us up in the air and we're gonna get sawed in half. And he goes, yeah, I know. I said, bring a cup. And he goes, why? He says, I said, I know Kane. Bring a cup. So Kane comes out, we're standing there, and he goes, wow! Right? And he lifts us up in the air. And as soon as we were done, Colton was like this, he goes, thank you. <laughs> so, so yeah, Kane plays hard. You would think that would be enough, but then there's the pranks, which I'm just as guilty of because I love doing it as well. Adam and I decided that it might be fun to scare Mercedes. Mercedes McNabb on the first hatchet started to complain after a while. Well, everybody else has been pranked and Kane scared them, but nobody's done anything to me. And I was like, you know, we were already planning it, but I'm like, now you're just asking for it. And so in the full Victor Crowley getup, Kane snuck into her trailer and just stood in the bathroom in the dark for a good 20, 25 minutes and just waited for her. And then Joel David Moore had a camera that day on set where he was just kind of documenting his day. And so they go into Mercedes' trailer and Joel's interviewing her. And when he says, so what was your favorite Victor Crowley moment? Kane just comes bursting out of the bathroom. Oh! 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 God damn it! And scared the absolute shit out of her. And it's, uh, it was very funny. And I think uh, she called me some names that I had never been called before, so that was pretty creative. <laughs> <laughs> what he wouldn't want you to know, though, is that the things that he wants, like in his trailer, are peanut butter and jelly, uh, and like DVDs of like Saturday Night Live. So like we would use code and be like, oh, bring another dead baby to uh, Kane's trailer, or yeah, another bottle of Jack or whatever. But it's really just peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. He's a very, very simple guy when it comes to that. My favorite Victor kill is one of the goriest kills in the history of cinema where he grabs the woman's mouth and rips it open. You know, anybody can t kill people with a gun, but how many pe people can catch a woman who's running away from them and put your hands in her mouth and rip her head apart? Now that's creative. I like the more hands-on, creative things. I mean, my, that's my favorite kill that I've ever done. <laughs> because when I started writing Kane's biography, 
Um, my aunt was like, oh, who is this guy you're writing about? So she decided to watch Hatchet. And she's never watched a horror movie pretty much in her life. And she saw that scene and threw up three times. And Kane thinks it's the greatest thing in the world that someone threw up because of a kill he had in the film. It's fun as hell to, to have an effect like that on somebody. I mean, for me, knowing that Kane is our stunt coordinator, I know like I don't have to worry about getting hurt. So I always say, like, if Kane's coordinating, I'm doing my own stunts. Unless Kane says, you can't do this, D, is the only time that I won't do it. When Adam first talked to me about playing Victor, I asked him if I could do something as another character and show some emotion because I wanted to show people that I could do something other than just violently kill them. And so that's when he came up with the idea of the father. He said, let's have you play Victor's father. I already believe that Kane could play Victor Crowley's father. So it's funny, he kind of approached that as, let me prove to you that I could do this. He was already cast, and I don't know if I should admit that, but I already believed he could do it just sat there for almost 10 years before he finally died of a broken heart. And I think he's surprised himself a few times, um, but I just love that he's up for the challenge. I mean, we all draw from our own life experiences and, and they help us become who we are and how we deal with things and how willing we are to open up. He got to be himself and not be covered in makeup. And he cried on camera for reals for the first time. And he was so inspired and moved by that. Like he got out of monster, stuntman, gonna do what I know how to do, and I'm gonna literally take the mask off, and I'm gonna be vulnerable. And that's something that I think is really hard for a lot of people, especially a, a man and, and someone like Kane. So when he did this scene, he got a taste of the bug. You know, they say like, when you get, when you get the bug, it's like a drug. So it worked out very well that started all the people thinking, wait a second, he can do something else, so let's try this. And that was the beginning of all of it. Every time I see Kane at the convention, of course, we're always choking each other. That's the first thing we do. We just go over and choke each other. He, he, can, he can really choke you. He's like, Kane, we're just joking around. You're like turning blue. Kane definitely choked me one time. He grabbed me. He's a tremendously powerful man, and his hands are <laughs> large. And so when he puts the grip around your neck, it's, it's surprisingly tighter than you think it's going to be. So you're like, oh, wow, that's fun. I can't breathe. You know, I'm known for choking people at conventions. And anybody that's had me do it knows that I choke you for real. I don't say it in like a cavalier way. It's just what I've become known for. People love it and they love to bring their friends who have never met me because they, they can't wait to watch the reaction of the person because they all been through it. Watching people turn blue as he chokes them. <laughs> yeah. They're a little unexpected. I thought I was dying, because I was like, I'm fucking getting choked, what's going on? Holy shit. Yeah, it does seem real. You can feel the pressure of the hand grip around your neck. It definitely felt real. It felt real. It was awesome. Has he ever choked you? Yeah, it hurts. <laughs> it choked me to death, I don't know. I introduced Kane to my mom, and he's like, come here! And he does it, and I'm just like, that's my mom, I'm like, Kane, stop! She can't breathe! <laughs> I've been choked by Kane quite a few times. It shocks you a little bit. I guess that's the idea. I was new to Kane's uh, choking uh, tricks, and uh, Kane put his hands on mine and started squeezing really hard. And I realized, oh my God! And there was nothing I could do in terms of countering his power. Kane was really choking, and I and I, I panicked. Like he'll he'll grab someone. He'll grab them. I mean, he'll you'll hear them go. Oh, oh. He really gets in there. I think he enjoys kind of actually scaring people. Like, for real. He's the only one I've let choke me, so. <laughs> People love to get choked out by Kane Hunter. I don't get it. I don't understand. It does nothing for me. <laughs> but, but I guess if, like, that's your chance to be in a scene, essentially, with Jason. Well, my experiences with Kane are not horror related. My experiences with Kane are comedy related. And what a lot of people don't know is that Kane is very funny. He's a natural comic. By the time we got to Holliston, I mean, at this point, 
Kane doesn't even need to see a script, I don't think. I just say, oh, hey, we're doing this, and he'll be like, great. He said uh, he wanted me to play myself in it, and I thought, that's interesting. The idea of making fun of the whole Kane losing the character of Jason and Freddy versus Jason thing, and making that a plot point, and having him own it and laugh at it and make fun of it, was huge and for me I was just like I hope he gets it and this was somewhat a touchy subject not long before this he said now I want you to freak out and try to kill yourself every time somebody says Freddy versus Jason I was like wow that is going into an area that was once very sensitive to me but maybe it's time to make light of that and uh, that's exactly what we did God. Oh! Hey. He got it, and he realized, hey, if I do this, it goes away finally. If I'm the one to stand here and make jokes about it and be all pathetic and try to kill myself anytime somebody says Freddy versus Jason, nobody can say anything anymore. And so I tried to make fun of it, and the fans responded to it. They respected the fact that I could finally do that and uh, it was a fun thing to do i don't have any friends i'm not even jason anymore now i'm gonna get stuck doing friday the 13th ripoffs with wannabe young directors that think they're making the next horror icon nice ad lib dick you like that i've never had an acting class in my life i did do uh, a stage production in high school on Quadge. The Academy wishes to present this special award for service, loyalty, and dedication to the oldest member of the performing, but I had never been trained and still haven't ever had any formal acting training. So if I do in fact have any talent with acting, it's got to be from watching quality actors work in person. Did a movie called Monster with Charlize Theron. I was a stunt coordinator on the, on the movie and I always say that was some of my best acting training was watching her work. And I was on the set every day helping her through the action stuff and watching her prepare and do scenes. And then the director said, you know, I think I want you to play a cop in this movie. I was like, a cop, wow. I'm always a bad guy. This is one of the first times I've been asked to play a good guy. I'm gonna be a cop, finally, something good. And she goes, yeah, you're gonna be undercover in a biker bar. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. Same thing as always. Two whiskeys, two beers for the lady. Hey, VG, come in here much? Hey. Oh, come on. But it was very cool to do a scene with someone who wins an Oscar for the character that they're playing in the scene you're doing. You know, I was so proud of him for, for, for doing that because it's such an amazing movie. Um, and all of us get pigeonholed into certain things and to, you know, break out of that has been uh, amazing. He made that transition from stuntman to stunt coordinator to actor and really did all three very effectively. I personally, I love seeing him without the makeup because he is a good actor and people have finally given him a chance to, to, to show his acting chops. Another guy that I credit to helping me expand my acting career in a big way was Mike Pfeiffer. I think that Kane was at a place in his career where he was looking to, to do real roles, to actually show that he could act. Um, I think you can imagine you're behind the, the, the mask for so long. Uh, you know, nobody knows who you are, what you look like. Keen is an actor. He called and said, hey, I'm going to do a movie about Ed Gein. I want you to be in it. It's based on the story. I think you would be good in the role. And I was impressed that he had that confidence in me. I specifically remember a moment where 
uh, uh, he's sad and he's upset and he has his mother's, a picture of his mother and he drops the picture and he hits the wall and he slides down the wall crying. And I was like, wow, I mean, uh, there's somewhere he's reaching. I tried to make him uncomfortable all the time, just kind of weird and creepy because that's kind of the impression I got from reading books about Ed that he wasn't really that terrifying, but everybody was always like, God, that guy's weird. And so I tried to make him just feel uncomfortable all the time, and it was great playing a character like that. He said, I liked what you did in Ed Gein. Now I want you to play Dennis Rader, who was a guy known as BTK, another real guy who was a serial killer, and I loved that role because here's a, a character that an actor would die for because he has to be really likable in a lot of scenes because that's what the history was with him. People loved the guy. He was a church president, he was a Boy Scout leader, and then he was a murderous maniac. That's right, girls. Your father has been chosen to take the church down a new path. I think he really sort of creepily enjoyed playing that character. So it was kind of fun to watch Kane inhabit this role of this straight guy who's really mean and nasty. Kane and I are doing a movie together called Death House, directed by a guy named Harrison Smith. What I love about Kane is that uh, he speaks exactly what's on his mind, and it was a lot of fun working with Kane. It's awesome. It's kind of like the Expendables of horror. It's got all kinds of horror stars in it. Um, Kane's like the big bad guy in the script. Kane's character, Sieg, has a very unique ability to regenerate. So he gets shot, bullet holes seal up, things like that. The way out is not that way. It's down to them with me. To work with him as an actor, consummate professional. He's really concerned about the quality of his performance. And most of all, that imagination of his, like he brought, I mean, he was the character. That's what I loved about it. He took this totally seriously. But after we were done shooting, Bill Mosley said, he goes, this is Kane's movie. Now, Bill Mosley is also hyper intelligent. So when you get Kane and Bill Mosley together, I mean, I just sit there and it's like they're talking, you know, in cuneiform. It's like, I have no idea what these two guys are talking to each other about. But they both have really bizarre sense of humor. So, I mean, it's, it's always so much fun. And Kane is especially smart, and I think he prides himself on talking about his uh, Mensa, because a lot of times we play, you know, pretty kind of dumb, scary, you know, one-note characters. I will fuck you in hell. It's sort of been, you know, in the works for a while, and some of the, you know, best horror icons are involved. I don't know what Kane's career would have taken had he been cast in Freddy vs. Jason. It didn't happen, and Kane, being a survivor that he is, and most of all, transcending that mask role, went off and forged uh, another career. Nobody handed it to him. He worked his balls off to get back. And I mean, he worked and he worked and he worked and it finally paid off. He got the Jason, the Victor Crowley and things like that. And honestly, just me, I'm proud of him because I've known him for a long time. And I know where he came from. I know, you know, the things that, that vexed him a little bit. While the burns scarred him physically forever, um, the worst effects from the burns were actually mental. I was burned uh, when I was a child on 35% of my body. We have talked about that and discussed it, and I think I kind of felt a little bit of camaraderie because of our burns and like getting through your life and kind of trying to deal with that. Most patients, uh, the recovery is difficult because of uh, post-traumatic stress. As a little kid, I had a really amazingly hard time and really all my life with it. And go through what he's gone through, I can't even imagine, because it took me my whole life to be able to deal with it. I started getting the, the, the feelings of, uh, and, and, and it's been, I've been to many therapists and stuff, and it's been classified as PTSD type thing from the accident, everything I went through, slowly manifested itself because since my parents and my sisters were the only ones that saw me and I got 
a staph infection and almost died as a result, that somehow I've come to the conclusion within my brain, I, not consciously, but that they had something to do with that. So for some reason, years later, gradually I started feeling that if my parents or my sisters came to where I lived, then they were bringing something bad with them. And it's, a, it's almost the worst part of this whole ordeal. Everyone that had anything to do with him at that time was suddenly infected. They were contaminated in a way. Um, even his own mother, who was the one who took care of him and stretched him and did every single thing afterwards when he came home, all the therapy with him, uh, if she wanted to see Kane, she had to go through what he calls a process. I would have to have them, once they arrived at the house, uh, give me everything they brought with them so I could put it in the washing machine. They'd have to go immediately into the shower uh, and get rid of whatever they brought with them. That's how it felt to me. If I washed all their clothes and they took a shower, then I was fine with them being in the house. It's ridiculous. I'm the first one to admit that it's ridiculous, but it was something I could not control. I would either ask them to do that or I wouldn't be able to have them come to the house. So what's worse? Now that my mom is gone, I've kind of seem to have lost touch with everyone. And it's, uh, it's a sad thing because I was always very close to my family and obviously it's, basically it's my fault that I don't. He lost a lot of family members because of it because they couldn't understand the OCD that Kane had. It's not something I'm proud of, certainly, and I'm ashamed of it. But it's just the one thing I was not able to beat and I have to live with that. I don't give up on anything. My wife and kids know that and they mean everything to me. My wife Susan is very, she's a therapist, she has a practice. Uh, for many years helping people cope with certain problems and stuff. So she's very uh, caring and empathetic and helps people get through some stuff, including me. I'm probably her star client because she's, I've had so many issues that she's helped me deal with and been very patient. I think what was horrifying to me was not so much the burn story, which is bad enough, but then the recovery story was really, I think, much longer and more tedious than it could have been or than it should have been. Being in the hospital for six months, I think, made him a much more sensitive person. Um, it made him a much more generous person. I love hanging out with Kane and his family because, you know, we were knuckleheads. We were young knuckleheads for a long time. And then, you know, then we both started families about the same time. And I knew him with Susan and in his relationship. And their dynamic is, is great. I just, they're, they're so different and yet they complement each other and it, it's just so fun to watch. When we really first started dating, I was a set decorator, but I stopped because it was exhausting and really hard. And having two people I found in, this, in a relationship that are in the same field was really hard. I think when Susan started seeing me really start working, there had to be uh, an element of concern with her considering I was doing dangerous stuff quite a bit. Earlier in his career, it's a little nerve wracking. There was like a few times when he would be doing really, like if he was doing average things and car stunts and those didn't worry me, but like things where he could get seriously hurt. Perfect example was I was doing a movie called House Two. I was testing a rope. There was a rope hung from the permanence in the soundstage. One of the characters had to swing on the rope from the top of the set on a long swing down into the set and then up the other side and then back to the top of the temple again. I swung out and as I was swinging back in, I hit part of the set and it knocked me off the rope and I fell about pretty close to 25 feet to the stage floor and hit really hard and right at that moment, Susan arrived on the set to visit. I just came down to visit. He was really excited to be on the movie. And one of the stunt guys I had there for the day ran over to her 
and said, oh my God, we thought he was dead. Oh my God, I thought he was dead. And I'm like, what? <laughs> but wait, wait, what do you mean? you thought he was dead and then she found out I had fallen and they showed me where he had fallen um, I think since that date that was the instance why I don't go to the set I think we've I've brought the kids and we visited the set but I don't I don't like to watch him work and I think he's nervous I have two sons Jason Reed and they're very responsible smart uh, well-adjusted kids he really is a wonderful dad and he's totally plugged in it's amazing that Kane is able to keep two completely different lives. He has this life of flying all over the world and putting on makeup and ripping heads off of people, and then he goes home and sits on his couch and watches, you know, a TV show with his family. You know, and it, if you saw a shot of them sitting there, you would think they're no different than any other family in the world. It's really kind of cool that he can keep up the balance of both of those and not, you know, let the two bleed into each other too much. When he's home, we still. Uh, enjoy our time together, watching TV and movies and stuff like that. Finding one of his movies every once in a while, watching a little bit of that, him kind of realizing how old it is, and then switching to a new channel. I think some of my favorite memories are probably when we uh, hang out together. Like, most fathers and sons don't really hang out that much like together, but I really enjoy hanging out with them instead of going out with my friends at night. Both my sons, when they visited when I was shooting Jason X, I was in full costume and I have a picture with both of them. Oh, that was that was one of my favorite favorite sets to visit. I was pretty I was pretty young and I mean seeing all the people in their makeup, seeing how futuristic everything looked. It was a really unique experience to be on a set of a movie with my dad and seeing him in person acting was really cool. The funny thing about Kane is, you know, he has such this uh, this intense sort of presence about him, but he's the nicest, kindest guy, you know, once you get to know him. Most people wouldn't think of Kane as being like, you know, kind of a nice, basically mellow, soft-spoken guy. You know, I'm sure he has his moments, but uh, I think that would be very surprising to a lot of people. Maybe he sews or does macrame or something. I'd, I'd be kind of curious what his hobbies are. the entire horror community. Like, I can say that bar none. Kane's body language, Kane's posture, the hockey mask, the way he moves, his bulk, all of that is the logo for the experience of 30 odd years of, of Friday the 13th films. He's a horror icon. Me being into the horror genre and loving horror movies, he is Jason. He is the epitome of Jason, God damn it! Know about it, motherfucker! He's by far the best Jason. He is known as Jason. That's, you can't really take that away. I have to think that uh, of all of them, and I've said this before, he is the one, the only, and the best. Everybody else can even compete with him. As a leader, when you're an icon, like if you wind up playing a role that becomes really important to people, there's a responsibility that comes with that. And Kane's one of the few who really takes that responsibility seriously. Well, I think my fans are the best. There was a big outcry from the fans when I was replaced as Jason. And, you know, that, that made me feel good that I wasn't the only one that was disappointed. Let's face it, I, if, if we didn't have fans, we wouldn't be in the place that we are. I have a reputation of being nice to the fans, and Kane has a reputation of really being fun with the fans. They love it. He makes everybody have their own special moment to walk away with. You know, he's definitely a, a fan's fan. Fans are everything to Kane. He goes above and beyond. Fans are completely the lifeblood of the horror community. You see dozens of horror conventions where people lined up who wait hours to meet their favorite celebrity for a few seconds. You might be doing a convention every weekend for a year or on tour promoting something, but for this person, they're waiting all year for this moment that you're coming to their town and they have something they want to tell you or, or share with you. And so you, you can't ever forget that. And it doesn't matter what else is going in your life. Like everything could be going to shit. You could have the worst day ever. You could be sick. For those five, 10 minutes that this person's gonna get to spend with you, like that's everything. And Kane really gets that. And that's why the same fans will come see him all the time. It doesn't matter that they already got his autograph once. They just wanna see him. Uh, and that's huge. Even a couple people in line ahead of me, just how he was talking to them. They'd ask questions I'm sure he's been asked 80 times a day. And he still answers it enthusiastically as much. But he's still got that snarky asshole attitude that, that you love about it. 
which makes it perfect. <laughs> the first photo we took, um, I was wearing my hockey mask. I did what Kane does. I um, did that heavy breathing where he like lifts up his shoulder, like, and tilted my head a little. Um, he smiled at that. I think he thought that was cool. So he gets it, okay? Just like a few of us get it, that the fans are the ones that are really important in this whole scenario. I mean, we're just guys doing our job. The fans are the ones that make it all happen. They're the driving force. Whenever I'm with him in public and he gets recognized by someone, he's always happy to take a picture. They're really important to him, and that's why he does so many conventions to meet all of his fans. People come to see Kane Hodder for a reason over and over. I mean, his line never ends. I was very envious of him because he had a line going clear out the door, and I had nobody at my table. He's so appreciative and so good with the fans. I, I don't think you could have a better ambassador for a franchise. That whole segment of fandom didn't get the respect. Now I think everybody realizes that the horror movie, uh, like the science fiction film or the fantasy film, is a go-to popcorn ingredient in the soul of Hollywood. Horror fans, they tend to be very fervent for some reason, I'm not sure why. Like, you don't have people tattooing Adam Sandler on their body. I, I'm not sure why. Maybe that would be a good tattoo. But, but you know, Kane Hodder, I'm sure he's on a lot of bodies as a tattoo, you know, the, the classic face. I do have this Kane tattoo right here. I have uh, Jason from Park 7. I had gotten this tattoo, it was the, the first one I had on this arm, and he comes over to me, he's like, you're a huge fucking fan, but you got the wrong Jason on your arm, and then he socked me one, and I was like, all right, this is how the relationship is gonna go from now on. Now he has a whole new fan base of a younger generation who grew up watching the Hatchet series, and you know, those kids' parents grew up watching the Jason series, you know, so it's, it, it's changed and gave him a whole new rebirth in his career, and now he's doing almost 20 movies a year because, you know, People want to see him do stuff. I think Kane is relentless when it comes to anything that he's passionate about. He overcame a lot of things, and that's by his own volition, by a force of will. Some people just don't have that in them anymore. They give up, they roll over and die. Those are words I cannot use to describe Kane Hodder. And so whether, you know, you want to draw an analogy to Jason who never dies, maybe Kane never dies. I'm blown away by his history and what he's gone through and, and just how he's a triumph and he's the coolest man walking, really. A man with that much fortitude, desire and ambition to go through what he went through uh, is amazing. You know, to go from what happened to him to being one of the best, you know, in the business as a burn guy, I think pretty much tells you all you need to know about Kane. The guy's got balls of freaking steel. A lot of people would have just sort of been like, well, I had my time and that was my thing and I'm just gonna kind of be put out to pasture and do the conventions. But he was smart enough and still hungry enough when, when Hatchet got put in front of him to say like, I'm gonna go at this with everything I have and I'm gonna keep going and I'm gonna keep showing people that I'm just getting started. More people should, should approach their work and their life like he does. When you go through an ordeal like that, you begin to take life seriously. You slow down for a second, and, and you make sure that your next step is the right step. And I think that's what Cain does. The fact that I was, you know, suicidal thoughts and stuff, I know how you can get to that point, and I understand when people get there. I think I could have been justified possibly ending my life then because of everything I had been through. But look what I would have missed. That's, that's huge, I think. That's, I, I hope to instill in people that get to that point, you don't know what you might miss. And I would have missed all of this.
Totally if he's just getting started. There's like 10 more years from now, there could be a whole nother documentary about like, yeah, so he did all of that, but then he did this. Choke me out. You ever hear the expression, rip off your head, shit down your throat? I don't know, maybe if you made me like eat my own shit, or if, uh, or some script that I wrote and stuffed it down my throat and made me eat it, or just shove my own movies down my throat or up my ass. I'd... I thought we were gonna be friends and partners. What, what do you know about the script that I don't know? I'd like to be beat to death by two naked ladies. Wow. Number one, his character couldn't kill me because I can whip his ass any day of the week. Period. With kindness. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know how to love you. Um, we'll see a particular way. How about he and I are both burned up in a fire? You. <laughs> by, by the way, I don't know if you know this, Kane has killed more people with his hands than anybody else in movie history. I don't know if you know that. 